Yeah, okay. So uh, let us uh, continue where we stopped before. Uh, and just to just to say a little bit more about where we left off before, and that is to remember that when you read the suttas, uh, to take the context into account. Uh, so when you see a verse like this about, you know, not thinking that they robbed me, they beat me, these kind of things, the context here is really the Sangha being split and how the monastics should deal with each other. That's the context. And that context is important and it doesn't necessarily mean that this is the only way or the full way or the, even the right way in other contexts. So we have to kind of adjust our perception a little bit depending on what the uh, surrounding uh, ideas are. So that is uh, that's an important point generally when you read the suttas, to remember that. Uh, the suttas don't always directly answer the question that you may have, uh, or that may be on top of your mind. Uh, it answers a question that is relevant in that sutta, depending on the context you're seeing it. Uh, so please uh, keep that in mind as we go along, and then I think it will make more sense how these things actually, uh, how they work. Uh, so we have, then we have the uh, next verse here, very famous verse. Uh, also found in the Dhammapada, uh, and this is uh, the idea of how to overcome hatred or ill will. Vera is the Pali word here, which means like uh, hatred. Uh, uh, for never is hatred settled by hate. It is only settled by love. This is an eternal truth. Uh, yeah, and uh, we know what it's like. If you hate someone who hates, usually the cycle just goes on uh, and they hate you back. Uh, and uh, the idea here is to stop that cycle by standing back and uh, not kind of buying into that uh, whole idea. Um, and of course sometimes it is difficult to do uh, and there are situations where it's hard, uh, but it's something that anyone who is serious about Buddhist practice should uh, endeavor to do, at least to some extent, and not just buying into that endless cycle back and forth of ill will and anger and hatred, what is so common in the world. Uh, Revenge begets revenge, begetting more revenge, and uh, going around and around, uh, never finding any solution to anything here, yeah. and realizing actually that's not the path. That's not the. That's no one become happy. No one actually achieves any contentment or satisfaction that way. Yeah. Someone has to break that cycle. So let us be the first ones to break that cycle, yeah. and then we are kind of doing, helping not just ourselves but helping everyone else uh, in the uh, in the process. So there is a nice sutta that, uh, where the Buddha talks about how he deals with anger and hatred directed towards him. It's kind of extraordinary, but even the Buddha had to deal with anger and hatred. Uh, there is one sutta um, where there is uh, this uh, Brahmin, the Brahmin is called uh, Kosaka Bharadvaja, no, Ak Akosaka Bharadvaja, Akosaka means uh, the abuser. So he's called Bharadvaja the abuser. I don't think he, his mother called him that, but that was probably just a... <laughs> probably was a, a nickname he got because he wasn't a very nice fellow. And so he goes to the Buddha and he abuses the Buddha because uh, the Buddha has ordained many of his family members and he's not so keen on the f Brahmins are proud people, yeah, because the Brahmins are proud people, they don't want the, uh, the family members to become Buddhist monks. The Buddhist monks are considered the lowest of the low, yeah, the bottom of the world. Uh, in the suttas they are called the, the scrapings of Brahma's feet. The scrapings are that that's kind of the the uh, the summoners, yeah, including the Buddhist monks uh, and probably the Buddhist nuns as well, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so, so really considered the very bottom of society. And of course, if you go from the top of society to the bottom, that's considered a bad thing. So he goes to the Buddha and he abuses the Buddha, and the Buddha says to him that uh, I sorry, I don't accept any of your abuse. Uh, yeah, I. And the Buddha gives him this nice simile, he says that, well, you know, you know, Brahmin, when you have a dinner party and you invite lots of people over for dinner and you have a meal together, uh, and then everyone eats and then they leave the house, and then who owns the leftover of the food? Uh, well, actually, and the Brahmin says, well, it's me, I own the leftover because I had the dinner party. Uh, in the same way, I don't accept any of your abuse, you keep all that abuse for yourself. <laughs> And that's the problem. Yeah, sometimes when we abuse someone who is very pure and very uh, special, uh, actually the results that we get for ourselves can be very, very severe. Uh, so if you're going to be abusive, be, make sure you don't abuse the wrong kind of person. Never be abusive. That's kind of the bottom line here. Uh. So um, yeah, so this is uh, 
uh, the idea here, overcoming hate and ill will, etc. Others don't understand that here we need to be restrained. But those who do understand this, uh, being clever, settle their conflicts. Sometimes you have to hold back. Uh, sometimes you have to be the wise one. Uh, sometimes you just have to remain quiet uh, when other people argue, uh, not really say anything. Uh, it's the wrong time to speak. Knowing when to speak is a very important part of uh, Buddhist right speech. And one of the strange things that you will find is that uh, the defilements that we have, things like ill will and desires and all of these kind of things, uh, they are very compelling things. They compel you to act very often. Uh, if you feel ill will and you feel that something needs to be sorted out, you feel this powerful urge inside to speak. And so these defilements are very compelling and this is very dangerous territory and this is why restraint is required because actually it can be very hard to restrain because of the power, the force of the defilements in the mind telling you, you have now is the time to act, now is the time to speak. So understanding restraint is a very important one and uh, you will see that the people, the wise people in the world, they very often don't take part in conflicts, they stay on the sidelines, they don't really engage at all. Uh, and they allow other, pe other people will get engaged uh, and they kind of just stand back and notice that. Uh, notice that the wisdom that is there in people who actually hold back from these things. Uh. So um, restraint is an important part in these kind of situations. Uh. And uh, if you have restraint, one of the, the strange things is that you, it is possible to live without having any enemies in the world. Uh. No one that you are in conflict with. Uh seeing everyone in the world as your friend, having compassion and metta for all people in the world. Uh, and that's a beautiful way to live, and even though other people may even hate you or dislike you, or have problems with you, or think that you are stupid, that's actually their problem. Uh, you don't have to buy into that. Uh, and you can be their friend even if they are not your friend. Uh, that's kind of weird, right? Uh, and the reason is because you can have compassion for them. You, you know yourself. Uh, you know that you're a good person, uh, you know you're living well. Uh, if they are angry with you, uh, actually, they are the ones who have the problem, not you. Uh. And this is kind of the security you get after a while, when you live well and you live generally with kindness. Uh, you feel good about yourself because you know that you're living an upright life with virtue and kindness and these things. Uh, and you know that other people's criticism is kind of irrelevant. I look at, uh, you know, people who uh, criticize uh, you know, everyone gets criti criticized sometimes. Uh, and, uh, but when the people who, you know, if you look at someone like Ajahn Brahm, he doesn't normally criticize people. Uh, and I live with Ajahn Brahm all the time. He never really criticizes me. Uh, he, you know, he doesn't say very much at all. Uh, and uh, he, he just, you know, he has kindness and compassion and looks at you with kindly eyes. Uh, and wise people don't usually criticize very much. Uh, they might say something if something really is wrong, uh, but actually normally not. Uh, and, uh, but the foolish people, they criticize left, right and center here. Uh, and that is a sign of a foolishness in the world uh, when that happens. Uh. So be a friend to everyone in the world, regardless of whether they are your friend or not. Uh. Breakers of bones and takers of life, thieves of cattle, horses and wealth, uh, those who plunder the nation, even they can come together. Uh. So why on earth can't you? Uh? Is the Buddha despairing a little bit at his monks? Why, you know, <laughs> shouldn't you be able to live in harmony when even these dodgy characters can live in harmony? Uh, surely. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so he uh, is kind of uh, making a point there. Uh, if you, f bit of dry humor, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, yeah, maybe. <laughs> if you find an alert or a wise companion there. Uh, uh, nipaka is the word there, it's like discerning a wise or alert or something like that. Uh, a wise and virtuous friend, uh, then overcoming all adversities, uh, wonder with them, joyful and mindful. Uh. So if you find a virtuous companion, then, then you have a Kalyanamitta, because this is what Kalyanamittas are, they are the virtuous and wise companions. Uh. And if you do find such a companion, especially someone who may be even wiser than you, someone like the Buddha or something like that, uh, then of course you go with the Buddha. And uh, one way of going with the Buddha is to just read the suttas and understand the message of the Buddha. You take in the Buddha as your Kalyanamitta. 
But um, in the world, we should be careful with uh, hanging out with too many Papa Mittas, the bad friends. Uh, because the Papa Mittas, whether you want to or not, they will influence you, they will affect you over time. Uh. So it is important, of course, to be kind to everyone. Uh, and sometimes we can have a positive effect on bad people, and it's good if you can have that. Uh. But don't spend too much time yeah, with the people who have a negative effect to think in the wrong way, because they will have an impact on you, whether you want to or not. Uh. So then it's better to uh, just be by yourself rather than hanging out with too many people with the wrong ideas. So keep that in mind. So be kind, but don't spend too much time with uh, uh, such people. Don't make the, your, you know, your closest friends, because then you might have a, have a problem if you do that. However, if you do find a good friend, then that positive reinforcement you get from being with the Buddha, being with a good person, uh, is always going to be a, an aid to you to kind of improve your own practice. If you find no alert companion, no wise and virtuous friend, then like the king who leaves his conquered realm, wander along like a tusker in the wilds. The king who abandons the conquered realm, uh, I guess the conquered realm, I guess they're going to be angry and enemies, right? They're going to be bad friends, I suppose, those people you conquer. So you realize that was a mistake, I'm going to leave it. And then you wander alone like a tusker. A tusker here is like an, kind of an elephant with large tusks. It has a, usually a big male elephant is usually what is meant by this. And sometimes they are famous for wandering in the forest by themselves, yeah? hanging out in the forest, not kind of wandering with anyone else. So be like the tusker wandering alone in the forest, in the wilds. Uh. It's better to wander alone. Uh, there is no companionship or fellowship with fools. Uh. Wander alone and do no wrong, uh, at ease like a tusker in the wilds. Uh. So are you ready to be a tusker in the wilds? Uh? <laughs> Sounds nice. So um, you can see here that the Buddha you get the feeling he's about to leave, right? <laughs> talking about wandering, talking about the companion with fools. Uh, he's probably looking at his monks and thinking that they are behaving foolishly and uh, that this is a problem. Uh, and now he's ready to head off into the forest like a tusker by himself. Uh, so uh, this is the, uh, these are these uh, marvelous verses. Uh, yeah, and. Uh, the, uh, of course, this is the kind of practice you sometimes find also in the suttas. Uh, the practice of uh, you know monks or someone just wandering alone, living by themselves. Uh, it's not that uncommon in the suttas. In fact, you even find it sometimes in the present day. Uh, you find people living this incredibly solitary life and living by themselves. Uh, and sometimes, if they're not ready, people actually do go crazy. And uh, other times, if they are ready, then they will be able to use that solitude to great advantage. Uh, so now we're going to see how the Buddha leaves uh, the uh, Sangha and uh, wanders like a tusker. And he goes after here, he goes to visit a few monks who are living in the good way. Uh, and then after uh, visiting those few monks, then he, according to this other sutta, the, uh, this is the uh, Vinaya account, then he goes off to the famous Parileyaka forest. Yeah? And I'm going to read that out for you. First of all, I thought, uh, because it's kind of nice and it's good to, this is kind of a suitable place to uh, read it out, because otherwise the story goes on. Uh. So let's have a quick look at the, uh, the Buddha visiting the Parileyaka forest. Uh. See if I can find it here for you. We, yeah. So here we are. Okay. So after visiting all these other monks, uh, then uh, uh, he gets up from his seat and he sets out wandering towards the Palileyaka forest. You, you won't find this in your notes. This is like a special extra that I just decided to, to read. It's not actually in the book, yeah? So you have to, now you have to follow the screen over here. It's not in your book, uh, Shui Huang? It's only, over, only here. Yeah, yeah. Not, not in the book, not o only over here. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so this is like special. This is what, what you, when you are the teacher, you have to have a few things up your sleeve, yeah? The, otherwise, you're not kind of. Uh, so you have to be smart like that. Uh, so this is my, this is the sleeve. So okay. So when he eventually arrived, he stayed 
in a protected forest grove at the foot of an auspicious sal tree here. Yeah, so uh, auspicious sal tree, in those days trees were sometimes considered auspicious. Uh, there were shrines, for example, that were trees and people would go to them uh, and they might pray or they might leave offerings for the departed and that sort of thing here. Yeah. So trees had a very special significance, especially the big, large trees uh, uh, in the kind of protected forest like this one's here. Uh. So that's where the Buddha goes, yeah, in, into this uh, forest uh, to be by himself. Yeah, he's fed up with the monks, uh, now he's going to hang out by himself. Uh. Then, uh, while he was reflecting in private, the Buddha thought, Previously, when I was surrounded by those quarreling monks at Kosambi, I wasn't at ease. Yeah? This is my translation, by the way, just to make it clear. This is not, uh, if you find fault, this is not Bhante Sujato's fault, this is my fault. Uh. <laughs> so, uh, again, you can see here the idea of even the Buddha not being at ease, right? Uh, and you might think that the Buddha would always be at ease because he's the Buddha. Huh? But even the Buddha doesn't really enjoy arguments and things. Yeah? He finds that kind of troublesome. Huh? And of course, if you are the leader of the Sangha and you want to create a strong Buddhist community that is practicing well and realizing the fruits of the path, it is a bit disappointing that the monks can't really get their act together. Huh? So you can see why even for the Buddha it, w it wouldn't really be at ease. Huh? So again, it brings out the humanity of the Buddha. Uh, and uh, so it's always good to have compassion regardless uh, of what is going on. Yeah? Everyone in the world uh, needs a sense of understanding and compassion and to listen properly uh, at those wise people in the world, especially the Buddha himself in this case. Uh. So uh, the Buddha is now happy. Uh, but now that I'm alone, away from those monks, uh, I'm happy and at ease. Uh. At that time, there was a large bull elephant who lived surrounded by a herd, by males and females, by juveniles and babies. He ate grass with the tips broken off and drank muddy water. Other elephants ate the branches that he had pulled down. And when he, he was immersed in a pool, the female elephants came rubbing their bodies against his. He considered this and thought, why don't I leave the herd and stay by myself? He then left the herd and went to the Palileyaka, to where uh, the to where the Buddha was. As a mistake, there to where the Buddha was at the foot of the auspicious salt tree, and he attended on the Buddha using his trunk to set out water for drinking and water for washing and to clear the vegetation. It's kind of nice, isn't it? Huh? The Buddha becoming, not the elephant becoming the upatak, yeah? the attendant of the Buddha. And uh, the, uh, in um, Buddhism we have this word called upatak. Upatak means like an attendant, basically. Huh? And uh, people looking after someone else. Huh? And uh, people were sometimes fighting to be the upatak of the Buddha. Huh? And here is the elephant doing the job. Huh? He thought, Previously, when I was surrounded by the other elephants, I wasn't at ease. But now that I'm alone, away from those elephants, I'm happy and at ease. After considering his own seclusion and reading the mind of the elephant, the Buddha uttered a heartfelt exclamation. Heartfelt exclamation is the Udana. Yeah, so we have the... Um, here the word Udana, there's a whole book called the Udana, and uh, the word Udana means something like, a, something like a heartfelt exclamation, a heartfelt utterance, uh, or, uh, some, or inspired utterance, or something like that. Yeah. The, my, the mind of this mighty elephant, uh, with tusks like chariot poles, uh, agrees with the mind of the sage. The sage is the Buddha, since they each delight in the forest solitude here. Uh, so the, um, the word is here, you see the word up here, the word is Naga. Yeah? The word Naga is an interesting word in Pali. The word Naga means many things. Uh, and usually Naga is kind of these serpents, yeah, or the dragons, uh, as it often is called. Uh, the fire-breathing serpents. Dragons is another word. Uh, 
or it can mean like a large animal or a large elephant, uh, very common is also called the Naga. Huh? But the Naga also means any kind of powerful creature. Huh? So the Buddha is also a Naga. Yeah? So Naga has a very wide application. So here the Buddha says the Naga, comparing the Naga with the Naga, yeah, the elephant with the, the human Naga and the animal Naga, so to speak, yeah? comparing each other. And they all like the idea of solitude, yeah? the large beasts. I know, I should, the large um, sages, the large, uh, the Buddha is the beast, the Buddha is a sage uh, of the world. Uh, yeah? They have this kind of similar idea, finally finding some seclusion and happiness in the jungle by themselves. Uh. I don't know, it's a kind of a sweet little story. And that story is also where you have the idea of the monkey coming to offer honey. Yeah? There's many versions of this story, they all vary a little bit. Uh, and it's all part of that same kind of uh, uh, s um, group of stories, if you like. Yeah. Okay, anyway, so that is, uh, that one is kind of cute. When we, I like it when we do suttas, that we do some things that are profound, some things that are funny, and some things that are just cute. Yeah, because it kind of makes everything kind of be broadened out, the scope of the Dhamma. Yeah, the Dhamma has all of these kind of qualities uh, to it. Yeah, sometimes it's just sweet, and that's also nice. So, um, now, those are those famous verses. After speaking these verses, uh, while standing, the Buddha went to the village of the, of the child salt miners, uh, where Venerable Bhagu was staying at the time. Uh, the village of the child salt miners, this is the Balakalona ka, uh, Balakalona Karagamo, uh, Wow, it's a mouthful, Balakalona Karagamo. <laughs> and uh, I, I think it should just be called Balak Balakalona Kara, actually, because uh, the child salt miners, we don't usually translate names, and names should usually be left for what they are, in my opinion. But anyway, there you are. So that's where he goes next. And uh, so the story then continues when the Buddha, Buddha meets uh, Venerable Bhagu very shortly. Uh, and we shall shortly see what that is about. Uh, but in the meantime, let's do just a few minutes of meditation together.
<coughs> okay. So um, this is a mistake. This is the mistake we had before. Uh, I'll show you the. Um, I'll show you how these things are translated. Because um, so the uh, this is the translation software that we use to translate the sutta. So it's called Bilara. Bilara is the Pali word for cat, and cat is computer assisted translation. That's why it's called Bilara. So this is the, uh, the software right here. You can see there's lots of, these are the various languages that the translation project is going into, all kinds of languages. Uh, uh, this is CA, what is CA? Catalan maybe, CS, Czech, DE, German, EN, English. So here, English. And you have the various people doing translations. So there's, that's me right there. And then you have the Vinya translation, uh, and you have the various Vinya things. Uh, and then you have, this is the Kandaka number, this is the 10th chapter of the Kandaka, so you have to load that one. And loading it, so this is the translation right there. So you have the Pali on one side, you have the English here on the other side. So the Pali is over here, that side, and then you have the English on this side over here. And then you kind of search for the mistake, and there it is, the mistake. He then left the herd and went to Palaika to where the Buddha was. So take that word out uh, and you just change it in here and then eventually and then you, now it's been changed. Uh, next time we look at Sutta Center, look at the discourse over here, uh, it will be changed over here as well eventually. Uh, it's pretty cool, isn't it? Uh? <laughs> so this is the translation software for you, give you some idea what's going on. Uh, anyway, I'm just, uh, just an excuse for me to do, make that change straight away. Anyway, so, uh, would anyone want like to say anything about uh, what we have been doing? Uh, any questions, comments about uh, anything? Yeah. Ah, Leong, yeah, please. Now is your now is your chance. Okay, great. Yep. about the subject of sectarianism. Sectarianism. Yeah, which yeah. involves a lot of disagreement in various aspects. Yeah. Could, could we have a bit of a okay, yeah. feedback and this discussion on this? On the sectarianism, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah because that yeah. touched on the topic of Guan Yin that has been mentioned in, in the past few days. Yeah. And uh, I felt that it's good to have a, open up the space for some feedback and yeah. And discussion. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, many I I felt that it was uh, well, it involved my personal painful strenuous investigation of the Tarababa teaching mm. as compared to the worshiping of Kuan Yin. Yeah. Because our parents come from very impoverished China, to come here to be hard labor, yeah. and they are mostly uneducated. Yeah. Like quite a lot of monks too, and they serve. Uh, the function of comfort for, yeah. for the public uh, by chanting and rituals, yeah. you know. So it's um, so historically. So our parents inherited that tradition of teaching. Mm. In fact, hardly any teaching, in 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 a way, yeah. rather than just worshiping and hoping and comfort. Yeah. Know? So after I come in touch with the Dharma and find the gems in it, I felt quite saddened that, oh dear, our, our parents, yeah. you know, have missed out so much yeah. gems, you know, 
and uh, I felt so sorry and saddened. But ironically, also after catching in touch with the gem of the teaching of the Buddha, yeah. I, I was quite surprised that I discovered the fine quality of my parents, you know, as my role model. Yeah. That, and they don't have Theravada teaching, you know, mm. but they have generosity, kindness, they have a fine, gentle speech, and uh, no bad biting, yeah. no no gossiping, which is very rare, yes. and and I come to appreciate. Ironically, after yeah. I learned that, you know, so yeah. I just want to share that historically, actually, yeah. the Chinese culture has married Confucianism with Buddhism, yes. merged together in such subtle way that was reflected even in modern songs and, and uh, drama, the dialogue. Yeah. You know, exactly. usually they reflect the values yeah. of Zen and of Buddhist quality that has been expounded mm. and through symbolism of beautiful nature like the morning dew, sun, sand and winds. Mm. It's always beautifully portrayed. Yeah. The values is so succinctly portrayed beautiful in poems and songs, even in the modern raps. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> it, it's just my, my, my personal journey that I want to share with. I think a lot of us also confused too because we inherit hmm. that culture, that the worshipping culture. Hmm. And the present new generation who know only Mandarin and perhaps less educated, sadly they continue to be very passive in their spiritual pursuit. Yeah. And they continue to be like spiritual thing is is the monk work, you know. Yeah. So this is still happening, and but yeah. in Malaysia we are very lucky that um, the tree tradition has always been building bridges mm. when it comes to auspicious occasion like celebration of visa or mm. all night chanting. We always invite all the tree tradition together. Mm. So that's, that they give a very good example to us, you know, yeah. to, mm. to build bridges, even though there are differences. Mm. And we are always been shown that the common ground of the A4 path, the noble truth, are, are the base. And the modern nuns and the monks of the Mahayana tradition, they are now very highly educated. Mm. So I noticed that uh, the, the, the emphasis on keeping the precepts has been more and more brought up to the surface rather than just chanting. I don't know much about the, 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 uh, the what do you call the, the other Buddha? <laughs> other than Amitab Amitabha? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that I don't know yeah, much okay. about that. So yeah. it's just that I want to share yeah. that there's this yeah. uh, confusion, but, but there's also yeah. this beauty of the merging. Yeah. It is it, it's, it's a hybrid, n not not a superior hybrid, I would say. Although we always say that mm. we have, you know, thousand years of culture and history, but I don't see as a superior hybrid. But it is a hybrid, mm. and uh, just recently, I, I I was so surprised that Confucian and Aristotle they can have a very nice conversation together. Mm. We share values. The emphasis of personal cultivation, yeah. of the high morality mm. that that a ruler of a country should have. Yeah. It's not so much about democracy or, and communism and all that. So it, it, it was through all this confusion and investigation that uh, I just want to share with with yeah. Ajahn. Yeah. And no. also that it, it was <coughs> yeah. quite a shock when I find that a tribal temple, ha have a big Guanyin temple, a, a statue in it. Yeah. My first reaction was was quite negative, yeah. you know. But the second time I see in the second temple, mm. I, I felt perhaps there's compassion there. <laughs> because, yeah. Yeah. you know, we are all so yeah. different makeup, yeah. a different level. So perhaps the temple, the management or the abbot, mm. our compassion, you know, just know that that's the needs of some of the public that yeah. they, they, they want both you know so yeah. it's, it's that's the 
the fortunate part of Malaysia that we have been able to have that friendly merging. Mm. But um, unfortunately, the, the, the Mandarin-speaking public is still not exposed much to the uh, Theravada teaching mm. because of the language barrier in some way. And being cyclical, you see, the, 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 the Dharma has been destroyed in India and has been supported all the way through the century mm. by China, Burma, Sri mm. Lanka. Without the Mahayana teaching, mm. it, it, it would have, I don't know, how would it be diminished or what? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So it is, yeah. uh, That's true. Yeah. and then it go one yeah. cycle that yeah. now we have so many um, so knowledgeable and sincere Western scholars like you and Ajahn Brahm and mm. Ajahn Sujato and many others mm. who come and teach. It's like, it's it gone one cycle. Things go in cycles, yeah. yeah. No, exactly, yeah. So it, yeah. it, it is, uh, yeah. so it, I just want to share this. Yeah. Okay. No, that's, <laughs> that's good. <all>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's great. I, you know, I think you're making many good points there, and I, I think we should be very careful with um, dismissing things like Kuan Yin and these kind of things. I think they have an important role to play, as you rightly point out, uh, and I think it's really how we relate to Kuan Yin is more important than whether it's Kuan Yin or not. Uh, and if we relate to Kuan Yin and we relate to that tradition we come from, even if you are a Christian, you come from Christianity, even if you are an atheist, you have no religion, uh, uh, really anything, it's, it's how, we, how we live that life that we're living which really is important. And if Kuan Yin, which obviously symbolizes, as you say, compassion and these kind of things, uh, if we follow the example and we practice accordingly, of course it's going to have, be very beneficial uh, and it's going to create good people like your parents, for example, and probably many others you know, like them. Uh, and then it is a positive thing in the world and it adds in the right direction. I think this it's a very important point and we should not be too dogmatic and too narrow-minded about these things. Uh, I, I fully agree with that. And uh, it's interesting, a lot of uh, monasteries around the world, not just here in Malaysia, but also in the West, uh, especially nuns' monasteries, they actually have Kuan Yin <laughs> statues. Uh, and the reason is because Kuan Yin is like a fem example of a feminine uh, Buddha, yeah, or a feminine sculpture, which then kind of brings the feminine side into, into Buddhism, which often is very kind of male, has been very male-dominated. Uh. But uh, there are Exam feminine examples as well, also in Theravada Buddhism, because we have all the, in the Theragata, we have all of the uh, Arahant Bhikkhunis, uh, so there are possibilities there as well. It doesn't have to be Kuan Yin, it can be, uh, can also be those uh, Bhikkhunis there. Uh, so I, I agree with all of that, what you're saying, and I think we, uh, uh, I think that's important. Uh, uh, I think at the same time, I think also it's very important to actually go back to the word of the Buddha uh, and to look at what the Buddha said because the reality is that things tend to get corrupted over time. Uh, that's just the na nature of things. And that's why the Dhamma will eventually disappear, yeah? because eventually it gets corrupted beyond recognition. You can't practice it anymore. Uh. So this is one of the reasons why, on, on the one hand, we, should not, uh, uh, we shouldn't be too um, dismissive of uh, these other directions. Uh, at the same time, we should also try to study the early uh, word of the Buddha to really find out what the Buddha actually taught to avoid uh, any corruptions that may have crept, crept in over time. So this is uh, so it's kind of to me it's it's both at the same time. Yeah, early Buddhism and also an appreciation of the later things, uh, and these things can happen simultaneously, in my opinion. And we should not be too too narrow-minded and too dogmatic and too fundamentalist about what is uh, you know what is true or what what isn't. And uh, at the end of the day until we become stream enterers and arahants, actually we don't know ourselves for sure, right? We are just kind of guessing what the, what the truth is. Hopefully we've got it right, uh, but uh, we can never be entirely 100% sure ourselves. So, uh, thank you, Leong, for that, uh, for that nice... Hmm. So, you want to spread the purity of the teaching? Mm. He asked everybody, asked the monk to go in all directions, Dharma, yeah. but then you have this proliferation of confusion and yeah. corruption, which definitely happened. And how, what would you think the Buddha think about the situation? Now that we are talking about conflicts yeah. and disagreements, and yeah. it, it is a very big issue. Because uh, like Chinese culture, they do have these beautiful values of benevolence, yeah. 
metta, love and generosity, which is all in it. Yeah. You know, it's so much in mm. it, you know. So we can call that corruption. I would call it a hybrid. Yeah. Not perfect one. Yeah. But what would the Buddha handle well, this situation? Well, well remember when we talk about corruption usually it, the corruption is not on that level because I think most people would agree about metta and kindness and generosity and these kind of things. Uh, corruption really happens on a much deeper level of deep insight. That's where corruptions usually happen. Huh? And the way that that is uh, talked about in the suttas is that uh, if there is a disagreement among the monastics about what the real Dhamma, the real teaching is, uh, they should come together and sort it out. Uh, but it's actually very important, according to the suttas, to keep the teachings the way they are and not allow them to change. Uh, it is in areas of non-self, uh, the areas of dependent origination, these kind of, that's where corruptions creep in, because they're so profound, very people really understand these things fully. Uh, and that's where the problems arise. Uh. On the more, on the more uh, not so deep levels, I think we can probably all agree, and that's the most important thing, because that's actually the foundation of the path for everyone. 99% uh, of people, they are, that's sufficient uh, just to deal with those issues. Uh. And it's interesting how, you know, when you read people like the Dalai Lama, for example, and the kind of teachings that he gives, uh, it, it looks like it's exactly Theravada to me. It looks, doesn't look much different. Uh, yeah, so this is the, uh, so there is a very broad agreement there. Uh. Okay. So, um, let us uh, carry on a little bit. Uh. So now we have the uh, uh, Buddha, he's going off to visit Venerable Bhagu. Uh, who is staying in the uh, this uh, Balakalonaka Gama. And this is what happens uh, when he goes there. The Bhagu saw the Buddha coming off in the distance. So he spread out the seat and placed water for washing the feet. The Buddha sat down on the seat spread out and washed his feet. This is the standard kind of a passage in the suttas. You find this everywhere. You make the seat ready and you put out water for washing the feet. Sometimes you also put out a foot scraper. Foot scrapers were used a lot in those days and a stool to sit down on. This was kind of the usual equipment for inviting someone when they came. And interesting here is that the Buddha washes his own feet, which is kind of interesting because these days if you're a monk, people, you know, it's kind of almost embarrassing because people sometimes wash your feet as a monk. Yeah. If, when the Buddha washed his own feet, it's kind of, oh, I'm not sure, <laughs> sure about this. Uh, so that's kind of fascinating, yeah. So uh, sometimes uh, the Buddha was very down to earth sometimes. Uh. Bhagu bowed to the Buddha and sat down to one side. Uh. The Buddha... Yeah, so they are on page, to top of page 27, in case you wonder where we are here. Yeah. Uh, the Buddha said to him, I hope you are keeping well, uh, mendicant. Uh, I hope you are all right. <laughs> and I hope you're having no trouble getting alms food. I'm keeping well, sir. I'm all right. I have no trouble getting alms food. This is always very, kind of very touching. This is almost always the way the Buddha uh, greets his monastic disciples, uh, always ask them first of all, how, how are you? Are you keeping well? Uh, are you getting enough alms food, right? Uh, of course, alms food being very important to sustain your life, especially for a monastic, uh, that you have no illnesses and these kind of things. Uh, and uh, the kind of the ideal in the Vinaya is that if you are the preceptor or the teacher, uh, you're supposed to uh, look at your, uh, the people who ordain with you uh, as your sons and daughters. Uh, and the uh, sons and daughters, the people who ordain under the Buddha, uh, they're supposed to look at the Buddha as their father in a sense. Uh. So you have that kind of, almost like this father-son relationship. Yeah? And this is kind of what you see here. Yeah? You see the kind of the care that is uh, put in there, uh, making sure that your uh, monastic uh, uh, disciples are, are okay. Uh. And this is what we mean when very often in the suttas, you see the suttas often start off by, you know, pleasant talk together. Uh. This is the kind of talk that is meant by that. So everyone is at ease, everyone feels comfortable, everyone feels that there is compassion in the air, kindness in the air. And when you feel relaxed because there's compassion and kindness, then you are ready to hear the Dhamma. If you sit down and you straight away ask a question about the Dhamma, yeah, no time to say even hello, 
then you, how can you relax, right? You, <laughs> you, you, kind of, you wonder what's going on there. So uh, you have to use a bit of uh, psychology, human psychology, to understand how human beings work so they can actually get the message across in the right way. Uh, the little things like that are actually quite nice. Uh, then the Buddha educated, encouraged, fired up and inspired Bhagu with the Dhamma talk, yeah? after which he got up from his seat and set out from the eastern bamboo park. Yeah? So this is the, uh, the whole of that little incident. Yeah? So the Buddha obviously found that Venerable Bhagu was a good monk, yeah? and when a monk is a good and the monk is willing to listen, then the Buddha will give him a talk. He will educate, encourage, fire up and inspire Bhagu with the Dhamma talk. Yeah? because he knows that he will take it to heart and he will practice in the right way. So this is how the uh, ideal relationship, if you like, between teacher and student, Buddha and disciple. What happens next? Now at that time the Venerables Anuruddha, Nandiya and Kimbila were staying in the eastern bamboo park. The park keeper saw the Buddha coming off in the distance uh, and said to the Buddha, Don't come into this park, ascetic. <laughs> there are three gentlemen who love themselves staying here. Don't disturb them. <laughs> so, uh, th this is a slightly uh, interesting passage. First of all, I have to say three gentlemen who love themselves. I'm not sure if I... That is how I would translate this. <laughs> it, is, it, it, is a, it is a slightly curious translation. Uh, uh, but it means something like they are here, there are three, uh, uh, three, three gentlemen is not such a bad translation, but there are three men or whatever uh, who are practicing for their own benefit or something like that. Uh, that, that to me kind of sounds more, uh, sounds more <laughs> Reasonable to me. This this sounds a little bit over the top. I am, I'm going to have to have to have a chat with my good friend Venerable Sujata <laughs> about about this. <laughs> but uh, what is kind of interesting here is that the park keeper, yeah, the the keeper of the park, he is the one who kind of guards the park. He's really guarding his monks. Yeah, he must really like his monks. Uh, and is really looking after them. Maybe those monks, they're probably really nice monks. These are monks who are practicing very well. We know that from the way they are portrayed in the suttas. And when someone is practicing really well, they become dear to you after a while. Yeah? When you know someone very well, you know that they are really kind, they have a very good character. After a while, they become like your monks. And you're proud of your monks. And they are dear to you. And you get this beautiful beautiful relationship between the, you know, the par keeper or any other lay person, really, and the monastic community in this way, where you kind of have this beautiful, harmonious and mutually supportive relationship between each other. And this seems to be what's happening here. So he keeps everyone out yeah, to look after his little monks. Or little, maybe little, little is the wrong word, little monks is his monks anyway. So then the, the Buddha comes and of course he doesn't recognize the Buddha. If he had recognized the Buddha, obviously he would have, might have said something else or maybe he didn't even even know who the Buddha was. He just knew that these are three monks. And uh, that part of that, what that probably means, is that the Buddha was just an ordinary, he looked like anyone else. Yeah, He didn't look like some kind of a strange being or anything like that. You may have heard of um, something called the 32 marks of a great man. Yeah, The Dvatingsa Mahapurisa Lakkana that you find in the suttas somewhere. And uh, those marks are really weird, yeah, they're really strange. You have like a protrusion on your head and you have like all of these kind of weird characteristics. And uh, that seems to be a Brahmanical thing that somehow crept into the suttas and actually has nothing to do with Buddhism as such at all. And uh, I consider all of those marks really just to be a later addition. Uh, and if you look at where they are found in the suttas, they look a bit like they are a later addition, that kind of uh, was used to convince people that the Buddha was a great man because that was the accepted standard in that society for a great person. So the Buddha was, looked like everyone else. He wasn't three times as tall as ordinary people. <laughs> there is a passage in the commentaries that says that uh, the Buddha 
Well, it doesn't actually say this directly. It says this indirectly. It suggests that the Buddha may have been three times the size of an ordinary person here. So he would have, standing on the ground, he would, his head would be touching the ceiling of, over here, right? Uh, would have been enormous. Uh, so the Buddha looked like an ordinary person. Again, there's a, one more thing that kind of humanizes the Buddha. Yeah, he wasn't, there was nothing all that super special about him when you saw him, except that he was very peaceful, of course, and these kind of things. Uh. So he stops him. And uh, then, uh, so, uh, don't disturb uh, these ascetics. Uh. And uh, then what happens is that Anuruddha heard the parkkeeper conversing with the Buddha. And he said to him, don't keep the Buddha out, good parkkeeper. Our teacher, the Blessed One, has arrived. Then Anuruddha went to Nandi and Kimbala and said to them, Come forth, venerables, come forth. Our teacher, the Blessed One, has arrived. Then Anuruddha, Nandiya, and Kimbala came out to greet the Buddha. One received his bowl and robe, one spread out a seat, and one set out water for washing his feet. The Buddha sat down on the seat spread out and washed his feet. Those venerables bowed and sat down to one side. You can see that these are the standard ways that these things are expressed in the suttas. The Buddha then said to Anuruddha. So what do you think he says? Well, you know that already, right? Uh, I hope you're keeping well, Anuruddha and friends. Uh, I hope you are all right. I hope you are having no trouble getting alms food. Uh, we are keeping well, sir. We are all right. Uh, and we are having no trouble getting alms food. Uh, so this uh, Anuruddha and friends is a bit strange, right? Uh, I hope you're keeping well, Anuruddha and friends. And the, the reason why he has that there is because uh, the Pali word, the Pali Anuruddha is a plural so quite literal, he's saying, I hope you are keeping well, Anuruddhas. So, because Anuruddha is the head monk, all the three monks are addressed through Anur the name Anuruddha. Yeah? So they're all called Anuruddhas because they are Anuruddhas and his mates. Mates is the Australian way of saying friends. Because I have an Australian passport, I have to use Australian lingo. <laughs> so uh, it means basically uh, Anuruddha and his friends. And this is a very important point. Because very often in the suttas, uh, when you hear the Buddha talk, he will always talk to the bhikkhus, uh, yeah, the monks. But that does not mean that there's no one else present in the audience. Uh, it just means that the monks are the more senior. They are the main, perhaps, audience, maybe the largest part of the audience, and certainly the most senior, and that's why he says bhikkhus. Uh, but in that audience, there could well be bhikkhunis. Uh, there could well be lay people, yeah, depending really on the situation. Uh, and so when you read the suttas, then remember these little things, because it actually means that uh, it is addressed to more than just the bhikkhus. The suttas are generally applicable to everyone. It is not the kind of prerogative of the monks to hear these suttas. And this is kind of the thing that you recognize when you read these sort of passages right here. And this is uh, so Anuruddha and friends. And they too are doing well. They are being well looked after. They are at ease. Yes, yeah, so everything is good, uh, and then the conversation may proceed. Uh, so what do you think that uh, monks and the Buddha talk about? Uh, don't read the page, uh, because if you read the page, then you are you're going to know already. <laughs> this is now is going to I'm going to I'm going to test you, test you first of all. Uh, so you can imagine what they will talk about. They will talk about practice, right? Uh, everything is about practical things, how to practice, uh, what to do. Uh, this is what they're going to talk about. Kind of obvious, right? But. Uh, Still, it's interesting to see how the Buddha and these monks, how they approach that. Uh, so this is kind of exciting here. Uh, because this is, these are the greatest arahants in the world. Uh, this is the Buddha, Anuruddha and his friends, they become arahants later on. Uh, how do they practice? It's actually really exciting. Uh, if you are interested in this path, if you also want to go as far as possible on this path, uh, this is kind of the core instructions uh, for how to go as far as you possibly can. Uh, so this is really interesting here, in a very deep way here. So make your minds peaceful and still, and be ready for these deep instructions. So. And you will be surprised when you see these instructions, right? Because you'll be surprised at how simple it is, uh, and how extraordinarily ordinary it is. Uh. And that shows you that sometimes the very ordinary things in the Dhamma are very profound and very beautiful. Uh. 
and it allows you to read the Dhamma in a new way. Yeah? We're opening your eyes in a new way. Yeah? So let's see how the Buddha and these super duper monks, uh, yeah, how they actually speak to each other, how they discuss the Dhamma. I hope you're living in harmony, appreciating each other without quarreling, blending like milk and water, and regarding each other with kindly eyes. Indeed, sir, we live in harmony, as you say. So this is kind of the first thing, yeah, about uh, the idea of living well and living in the right way and actually being able to make progress on the path. The idea of living in harmony, samagga, samagi, samagga, these are the words in Pali that means harmony or unity or coming together. Yeah? Yeah? And this beautiful idea of uh, appreciating each other, yeah? the idea of kind of having a sense of uh, rejoicing in each other in a sense, uh, seeing the goodness in the people around you, uh, blending like milk and water. It's the opposite of milk and oil. No, sorry, water and oil. Water and oil separates. Uh, milk and water blends perfectly. Uh, yeah, no arguments. Uh, working in unison uh, uh, in a beautiful way. Uh, regarding each other with kindly eyes. Pia chakuhi. Pia down here is a kind of deer. Chaku is I, just next to it. Uh. So uh, this is uh, the ideal. And... Uh, Harmony is such an important path, part of the Buddhist path. Uh, there are suttas in the Anguttara Nikaya that starts off with the idea of harmony. Uh, and from harmony arises the ability to practice the entire path. Uh, from harmony comes the possibility of samadhi. From harmony comes the possibility of mindfulness and all of these factors. Uh, without harmony, these things are to some extent destroyed. Uh, yeah, if you are in argument with someone, uh, if you are quarreling with somebody, if you're not at peace with someone, it's very hard to be peaceful afterwards. Uh, almost impossible. So the idea of focus on harmony within the Buddhist community is very important. Uh, blending like milk and water. Uh, this is so important. Seeing each other with kindly eyes. Uh, remember that, to see each other with kindly eyes. Uh, yeah, Remember to see the good in each other. Uh, one of the remarkable things is that in the Buddhist community like uh, the BGF or any other Buddhist community around the world uh, there are so many good people uh, and sometimes we forget uh, the goodness of the people around us because all we see we see maybe the little flaws uh, human beings we are masters at seeing the flaws in others uh, but there's a lot of goodness to be seen uh, and sometimes all we do need to do is to focus on the good intentions in the people around us uh, there's a lot to be rejoiced in uh, and if you rejoice in those things, uh, then when you come here and you sit down and we do the meditation in the morning uh, and you think how fortunate you are to have these Kalyanamittas, you can actually feel gladness for having people around you with these kind of qualities. Uh. It's such a beautiful thing. Uh, yeah? And so develop that perception of the goodness in the people around you. Learn to see that because it is there. Uh. And as you see the goodness in the people around you, it becomes a strength in your own practice. Uh, something you can take, take with you and you can sit down and you can feel a sense of warmth, a sense of good in your heart when you reflect on those qualities. Uh, so, such, such, such a simple thing yeah? and yet something we forget so easily yeah? and we end up instead maybe we're disputing because we think my view is so important. Uh, this is the right way, that's the wrong way. Yeah? Please put that aside because that is all the worldly stuff uh, and it gets in the way of the real practice. Uh, these are the monks who get it right. Uh, they are practicing harmony in this way. They are blending like milk and water. Uh, they are seeing each other with kindly eyes. Uh. But how do you live in this way? Uh? In this case, sir, I think I am so fortunate, so very fortunate uh, to live together with spiritual companions such as these. Uh. I consistently treat these venerables with kindness by way of body, speech and mind, both in public and in private. Let's just start with that. This is another very, it's so simple, it, and it's yet it's obviously very profound, because this is actually what enables these monks to become arahants. Yeah? Very simple things like this. So 
the idea of saying, I feel fortunate to live together with spiritual companions such as this, uh, is a very beautiful sentiment, isn't it? Uh, you feel lucky, uh, you feel a sense of gratitude that you have companions such as these people around you that are there, available. You have the Buddha as a spiritual companion. Uh, you have a number of monastics maybe that you invited to give talks who are kind of your spiritual friends as well. Uh. Then you have the community around you, all the lay people that are part of the BGF and anyone else that you know in the world. Uh. This is your spiritual community. Uh. Remember that you are fortunate to have people like this in your life uh, that enable you to practice properly, uh, that make the path happen in your life. Uh. Wow, I'm so fortunate to have friends like this, uh, to have teachers like this, uh, to have the Buddha in my life. Uh. That is the right kind of attitude. Uh. And when you feel that, uh, you're going to feel at ease, you're going to feel relaxed, uh, you're going to feel a mind that is uplifted, uh, a mind that is able to be mindful, a mind that is able to watch the breath. All of these things come together if you have these kind of thoughts. Uh. So, uh, yeah, these are the standards we have. Uh, very high standards, but very beautiful standards, uh, very evocative. Uh. I consistently treat these venerables by way kindness through body, speech and mind, both, both in public and in private. Uh. And this is the idea of what the Buddhist path really is about, is this consistency in kindness, uh, in everything we do. Uh. And if you are able to be consistent in your kindness towards everyone in your life, uh, especially towards those people who we are fortunate to have as your spiritual friends, uh, but anyone really, that consistency of kindness uh, that is where the path is made or not made if you don't succeed. Uh, moment to moment, uh, active with kindness by body, speech and mind as well. Uh, never allowing the mind to be overtaken by too many defilements, uh, too much negativity. Uh, remembering that if people get it wrong, to have compassion if you possibly can, except in certain extreme circumstances of course. Uh, yeah? And then you are developing these things, both in public and in private. Uh, you're not just kind in public, but even when you go and you sit down and you're by yourself, you still have that kindness in your heart, uh, geared toward these people, uh, always present, always there. Uh. This is this idea of establishing mindfulness at the back of your mind. There's many degrees of mindfulness. Uh, one degree of mindfulness is the mindfulness you have when you do your meditation practice. Uh, you're watching the breath, that's a very high kind of mindfulness. Uh. But there's also the mindfulness as memory, uh, to remember what you're supposed to be doing here. Yeah. And that mindfulness as memory yeah, is this kind of mindfulness, uh, where you program into your mind in a very deep way the understanding that kindness is completely crucial for this path to work. Yeah. And when that is programmed into your mind as a right view, when we talk about right view, these are kind of the critical things about right view. Yeah? When that is programmed into your mind in a very deep way, you never Forget the idea of kindness. It is always there at the back of your mind, reminding you. The moment you start to go astray a little bit, that view comes back and guides you back on the path again. So this is the purpose of being programmed. This is the purpose of having right view. This is the purpose of reading these teachings to kind of make that program inside of us as strong as it possibly can. This is what we mean by brainwashing. Yeah? to actually establish the idea of kindness very deeply inside her. And then you're able to, uh, to fulfill this path in a very deep way. Yeah. This is when we talk about metta, one of the things we talk about in the suttas is metta very often, translated as loving kindness or maybe just love or just kindness or just friendliness. Uh, remember that very, sometimes people think metta is something you do in your meditation, you sit down, you say, may the whole world be well and happy, and that is part of it. Uh, we can do that in meditation practice. Uh, but really, the meaning of metta starts long before that. Uh, and this is what you find in the Kosambiya Sutta we were talking about before, Majjhimanikai 48, uh, where the Buddha says that we should always have metta for each other, first of all, in action. Uh, have metta, have friendliness and kindness in action towards your companions. Uh, do whatever you can uh, yeah, through action to show your kindness. Uh, Metta in speech, speaking in a way which always is kind and compassionate and caring uh, towards others. Then comes metta in thought, yeah? how to care even in the way you think about others. And then once all of these things are in place, then metta in meditation really becomes possible. 
So start with the simple ideas of metta. Treat people well. First of all, in the ordinary ways, in ordinary life, your family members, your colleagues at work, your fellows at the BGF, any random person you meet in daily life, yeah? Everyone like that. Treat them with kindness in this way. The people in the shops, yeah, whatever it is, you treat them in the right way. Then you are starting to really fulfill this path. That is when this path starts to work. It is so simple, yet so profound at the same time. The Buddhist path is not difficult. We don't need to understand all of these profound things. Sometimes we need to understand the profound things in order to do the simple things. That's, that's the way it was a bit for me. I needed to have an understanding of the path overall. Then I started to be able to do the simple things. Yeah? It took me a long time to understand the simple things. Yeah? Tw after 20 years as a Buddhist monk, I started to click for me what I had to do. It took a long, long time. Yeah? And this is kind of the gradual brainwashing that starts to happen as you keep on doing this uh, again and again over time, reading these teachings, uh, trying to understand what they are about. Uh. Okay, let's do a bit of meditation again. Uh.
Okay. So, uh, any questions or comments, please? Good afternoon, Ajahn. Please, um, yeah. When the Bodhisattva descends from Tusita heavens and enters the mother's womb, yeah. the earth shudders and shakes and violently quakes. When the Tathagata gains supreme enlightenment, yeah. the earth shudders and shakes and violence quakes. Yeah. Is it true? <laughs> okay, well, okay, so uh, a very direct question. I, I appreciate that. No kind of beating around the bush, very straight to the point. Um, is it, is, is, did this really happen? And uh, I, I, this, I know where that comes from. It comes from the sutta called the Acharya Bhutta Sutta, Majjhimadaka 123, the wonderful and marvelous. And uh, it is one, probably one of the least reliable suttas in the Majjhima Nikaya. And uh, the way you can know that is because that sutta also exists. There's a version it translated into Chinese as well uh, of that particular sutta. And the differences are very, very large between those suttas. Uh, the most reliable suttas are the ones that are very much the same, whether, whether they find them in Chinese characters or you find them in Tibetan or Sanskrit or whatever, they're largely the same. Uh, the fact that they vary a lot shows that there has been a lot of additions and things going on to that sutta. Uh, that's the first thing about it. The second thing about that sutta is that it is spoken by Venerable Ananda, not by the Buddha. That's another important point. Uh, yeah? Usually it takes the suttas by the Buddha to be more important. Uh, and uh, the third is that it, it does contain all these marvelous and amazing things. And the more mar marvelous and amazing it is, usually it tends to be a sign that it has been added later on. Because the the word of the Buddha is usually very straightforward and simple, as we have seen already now. Uh, so I wouldn't take all of those things too uh, too seriously. There may be some of the things in that sutta that actually are authentic, uh, but s ma many of them are not going to be all that authentic. Uh, and if the whole earth is shaking, well, we would expect some record maybe. Yeah, In the past, everyone was shaking at the same time. Uh, so I think, to me, it sounds a bit dubious. Uh, so uh, I, don't, I wouldn't take it too seriously. I also I wouldn't maybe necessarily dismiss it out of hand. There may be some aspect of that which is true, uh, and some aspect that is more kind of uh, dodgy, if you like. Yeah. So, uh, but to be able to answer specifically, I would have to actually look at the suit. I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what is uh, found in the various versions uh, or whatever. Uh, so, uh, you know, yeah. Good. Venerable in Frontier. Uh, Venerable Punsiri Vara. Punsiri means the splendor of merit. The, the highest splendor of merit, yeah. Well, what's the difference between the observation and criticism? Observation and criticism, huh? Uh, it's the mind state. Well, you talk about, you know, <laughs> when somebody likes to criticize, uh, you know. It, it's, it's it's sometimes. Uh, yeah, yeah, you go ahead. Okay, it's where you're coming from, uh, and it's why you're doing it. And, uh, you know, in, in, in on the Buddhist path, there is a time to uh, help someone and to correct them because they're going wrong. There's, yeah. there's a time, time for that. Uh, but then there is... Well, there's an observation, right? That is, uh, I, I would call it constructive criticism, maybe, yeah, yeah or observation, <laughs> or, or something like that. Uh. <laughs> but I would, I would say that the difference is more between fault finding and constructive criticism. I would say that's um, more like the, the, the important distinction. Yeah, I'm guilty of that because I mean, you know, like <laughs> are you, when are you I'm guilty of constructive criticism or are you guilty of fault? <laughs> fault which, which one? No, I'm. Uh. You know, I've been. You know, a people when, like when I train seminary. Well, I observe, you know, how they, they do things, and then I try to correct them, hmm. and then they don't like that. Hmm. They yeah. said you only point, you know, the bad thing yeah. about a bad thing. Yeah. You know, my intention is to for them to do prop do thing properly, mm. but they don't take it. Mm. You know, they they say, well, you know, you just point about my negative yeah. things. Mm. So just like you, what you said, you know, people 
master of um, financial. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. You have to. I think the thing is that um, you have to remember how people react. Yeah, the, you have to. One thing is intentions, and uh, if but even though your intentions are good, sometimes uh, people are such that they're not able to uh, deal with too much criticism. Uh, and so I, you know, it's very important that we praise more than we criticize, uh, because uh, people need to feel valued. Uh, and I think that is often the, the problem, is that you need to kind of try to understand the psychology of people, uh, and then to see what works. So criticism should be, I think, even if it is very constructive criticism, and it's kind of meant to help, uh, it shouldn't be too much of it, because it, it is actually hard for people to take, usually. Uh. So I think that's kind of the, that's the thing, yeah, yeah. Well, didn't the Buddha say that, uh, you know, Kalayanimitta will point out yeah. your weakness? Yeah, but, the, but then again, we have to focus on the really big weaknesses, yeah? Sometimes there may be something really worth pointing out, uh, and there are other things that are not so, maybe so important. So you, you, you're limited to the really important points, uh, and then there's more chance that you will get through when that actually really matters, uh, maybe something like that. Huh? Yeah, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but usually, you know, my intention. I always have yeah. good intention. Of course you, you do. Know, for, uh, of course you do. Them, yeah. You know, yeah, that's yeah. why I said yeah, yeah. I know that they wouldn't like it, but yeah. you know, I want you know them to know yeah, yeah. <coughs> those kind of thing. But yeah. that's what I had been. Yeah. Sure. No, I, of course, you have good intentions. I have no doubt about that at all. It's just that uh, people don't always take necessarily it. take that in the right, right way, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, okay. Difficult to be a teacher. Difficult to be a disciple. Everything is difficult in this world. Eh? That's kind of the that's the hard part. Too. <laughs> so it's true, isn't it? Uh, being a human being. Yeah. We have time for one more question or comment, if everyone anyone wishes. Eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah some, g give someone else a chance. That's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Good afternoon, Ajahn. Good afternoon. Um, yeah. This is in regarding to uh, the Ayachana Sutta about uh, Buddha's uh, enlightenment, mm -hmm. and then he hesitated to teach. So there's this one verse that says this Brahma that came down and asked him to teach. Mm. So is this Brahma uh, a later addition to the Sutta? Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very interesting question. <laughs> and uh, the answer is that um, it's, it's, it's difficult to know for sure, of course. M many of these things are going to be uh, uh, just... Um, not, not exactly speculation, but educated guesses, and it's hard to have absolute certainty. But it's a little bit too convenient that Brahma, who is the leader of the whole Brahmanical world, uh, comes down to ask the Buddha to teach. It's very convenient for Buddhism, yeah? And it basically means that straight away the whole of Brahmanism comes under Buddhism straight away. Because if the highest god of Brahmanism worships the Buddha, of course, then the Buddha is the highest, and everyone else kind of fits under the Buddha. So it's, it's a little, it sounds a little bit like Buddhist propaganda when you, <laughs> when you read it. Uh, that's what it sounds like. Yeah. Uh, so uh, did it uh, actually happen? I, I have been discussing this with Ajahn Brahm many, many times, because these are kind of things we like to discuss. Uh, and uh, there, there's interesting, there's a parallel to that sutta, the Arya Pariyasana, the Noble Search Sutta, much, much when there's a parallel in Chinese translation, which is much briefer. And usually the briefer suttas that are missing some of the parts are often more authentic because things get, tend to get added over time. It's rare to take things out because taking things out is like destroying the word of the Buddha, but adding a bit more of the word of the Buddha is kind of, kind of okay, right? <laughs> And uh, so that version in Chinese translation does not have this whole thing about the Buddha being reluctant to teach. First of all, there's not, nothing about the Buddha being reluctant. And then it does not have the idea of Brahma Sahampati coming down and asking the Buddha to teach. That is also missing. So in that sutta, the Buddha just gets enlightened, and then he surveys the world to see if anyone is ready to hear the teaching, and then he starts teaching. And so from that point of view, it may look like that part actually is a, a, an addition yeah, later on. Huh? Uh, 
but then I have I discussed this with Ajahn Brahm. Ajahn Brahm said, well, when you are become a Buddha, you are so peaceful that you need something to get you started to teach. Uh, otherwise, you're just going to chill, right? Uh, you know, ah, then we sit back under the uh, sit back under the tree and just meditate all the time because you're so happy. You know, why, why bother teaching? And maybe that's why you have Pacheka Buddhas. Yeah, Pacheka Buddhas are the ones that just teach without actually no, sorry, just practice without teaching. Yeah. Uh, and so he argues that maybe it wasn't Brahma Sahampati, maybe some other person who came and asked the Buddha to teach. Yeah? And maybe that is true as well, I don't know. Uh, so uh, I would say my preference is to take that section out. I, I kind of like the idea that the Buddha just goes on and teaches. I, I, to me that seems more authentic. Yeah? But uh, because Ajahn Brahm is my teacher and I have a lot of respect for Ajahn Brahm, I take his opinion also very seriously. So that's kind of my, my bottom line here. Uh. In other words, I have no idea. <laughs> we don't know. I, my, my, again, my preference is to take it out, just to be clear. Yeah. Okay, let's have a break, everyone, and come back in 15 minutes. Uh.